Bethel sees this stone as bearing three words. Yanod da yada yar galon. And in the case of this particular site, every peak and every valley corresponds with a, an extreme position of the sun or the equinoxes. Rains, the rain concentrates along these little breaks in the rock and weather the rock a little more rapidly along the fracture than it does along the open face of the rock. Because as I looked under it, I was not only looking through this 26-foot chamber, but straight into a copper mine. Uh, we have established the possibility that they were built by colonial farmers. They built sun azimuth types of rock circles to judge latitude and longitude. It was part of their... I uh, proposed the uh, theory that uh, North America had been visited by peoples from Europe and North Africa over the last 3,000 years. And anyway, when one looks at all of these particular features coupled together, it, uh, it certainly uh, uh, gives the impression of something that goes way beyond, you might say, a barnyard setting. It was not long after man spoke his first word that he had his first argument. Socrates died of a public academic dispute. Galileo and Copernicus showed us our place in the cosmos, but they touched off centuries of heated dispute in the process. And Darwin's ideas provoked a debate that has not yet entirely died out. Every idea which suggests a new way of thinking must run a gauntlet of scrutiny and often skepticism from those who know most about the subject. If this scrutiny has at times restrained acceptance of ideas which we now know to be true, it has also exposed falsities such as phrenology and out-and-out -out frauds such as the Cardiff Giant and Piltdown Man. This process of suggestion and scrutiny is the keystone of academic debate. This program is about one such debate. Are they colonial remnants? Or are they, as some have suggested, remains of European voyagers who reached these shores as early as 1500 B.C.? Will we ever know the answers to these questions? And if so, how will we know? Perhaps most interestingly of all, why do we care? Of what value is this kind of knowledge? While the Vermont phenomena had been noticed for years, the current debate began in 1976 when Harvard professor emeritus Barry Fell, in America, B.C., theorized that Iberian Celtic peoples frequently crossed the Atlantic. In, uh, in uh, America, B.C., which is actually the first of a series of books, I uh, proposed the uh, theory that uh, North America had been visited by peoples from Europe and North Africa over the last 3,000 years, and I gave the evidence, which was in the form of inscriptions, by which we could identify the people who came, and supplementary evidence in the shape of buildings that we, I and my colleagues believed they had left behind, and identified the peoples as basically Celts from Iberia, Spain, and Portugal, and uh, Libyans from North Africa, with some other evidence of Egyptian traders and uh, other less important visits. Now, since uh, I wrote that book, the research has continued, and other installments carry the story of our visitors down to about 1200 AD, and we find that they include such peoples as Greeks and Romans, Carthaginians came more than once, and then uh, Christian refugees from North Africa and probably from other places. Then uh, they indicate that there were refugees from the Vandals, and then uh, came um, 
uh, Byzantine people, so after the Vandals were defeated, the Byzantine government uh, took over in North Africa, and there is a period when Byzantine Greek inscriptions appear here. And lastly, the Arabs, after 650 AD, Islamic ins inscriptions suddenly appear on the American scene, and we can date them roughly by the writing style. Warren Cook of Castleton State College has become a leading investigator. For over a decade, I had been very curious about the significance in North American prehistory of Mystery Hill in New Hampshire. And then in the summer of 1975, I read in the Rutland Herald that one Barry Fell, professor of marine biology at Harvard University, was uh, finding inscriptions on rock structures in many places in Vermont that were comparable to Mystery Hill, and uh, the structures were architecturally related to Mystery Hill. Well, at once I got in touch with him, and he took me out to a number of the sites, and I met Betty Sincerbo and uh, Byron Dix and other people investigating the subject that same day. And from that moment, I realized that uh, I would be remiss as a scholar if I did not find out what was going on here in Vermont. This stone is one of a trio found by Barry Fell and his associates in 1975, about a quarter of a mile from the main structure at Calendar Site 2. Of the three stones, two are roughly cylindrical and phallic shaped. This one, Fell translates as reading Wiesgeluja, in other words, sprinkle the chimney or uh, inseminate the vagina. The stone in the center was shaped uh, like uh, feminine thighs or buttocks. On the opposite side of the center stone was still another phallic shaped stone whose markings fell translated as reading for the loins of Bianu. Fell sees this stone as bearing three words. Yanod da ya da yar galon. Yanod da yada yar galon, he translates as meaning precincts of the gods of yar gal. If Fell's translation of this is correct, then this would be the oldest known historical document with a place name for any area in New England, and hence one of Vermont's most precious historic relics. Byron Dix has documented impressive astronomical alignments at lithic sites. The two areas I've been concentrating on in my efforts about these particular sites in central Vermont are areas I call Calendar 1 and Calendar 2. Now these uh, areas, uh, they, uh, they have a lot in common with each other. Of course, they each have a stone chamber on them. They have the possibility of astronomical alignments. There certainly appears to be a, a definite form of geometry practice in the overall layout of the, these sites. Uh, that m probably incorporates a three, four, five triangle. The sites in general are approximately the same size. They're, they're, they're also up very high. And anyway, when one looks at all of these particular features coupled together, it, uh, it certainly uh, uh, gives the impression of something that goes way beyond, you might say, a barnyard setting. Now, where we are here at Calendar One is, I think, a very, very special kind of place. Uh, this particular site, uh, has just so many horizon features. And what I mean by that is when one looks about, we have peaks and valleys situated all around us. And in the case of this particular site, every peak and every valley corresponds with a, an extreme position of the sun or the equinoxes. 
Of these six horizon features that uh, we're talking about, three of them have man-made features on them. Now, these features are in the form of a, one of them is a sort of a, a large slab, much like the one I'm standing by, except it has a large notch cut out in it. And that would, or could be interpreted, perhaps to uh, mark the winter solstice sunrise. And for the summer solstice sunrise, there's a standing stone approximately a meter high that's leaning. And for the, for the sunset phase, we have the peak, which we're looking at here, uh, that it can be used to mark the equinox sunset. And right at the peak is a very specially shaped stone uh, that also has a notch cut into it. And to either side of it, we, we have a dip, which you cannot see right now for the trees, that mark the summer solstice sunset. And then we have a sharp drop off on, on the ridge uh, that will mark the winter solstice sunset. Now this is an example of some of the many markings found in and about these sites. This one right here is a, is a, a, a grid-like feature. It's a, it's a matrix of uh, uh, 16 squares. And it's, a, it's a oriented on a slab. That's, this slab is running uh, pretty much true north and south. And so th this grid perhaps could have been used as a sundial at one time. Uh, such things uh, have been known to exist in other parts of the world uh, where they were known as plinths, and which uh, they were used to determine the, the uh, uh, longest and shortest day of the year, on the longest and shortest day of the year, the maximum elevation of the sun. And this one is so set up that it could be used as such also. Another interesting thing about this particular area uh, here we have these large slabs of stone, which are, 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 are very unusual features of wall building. Uh, this area also has other uh, possible astronomical significance in that you can use it as an observation area for the winter solstice sunset also. A very good example of calendar site, too, is uh, was a very magnificent chamber there. Its interior dimensions are approximately 10 feet wide and 20 feet long. If one positioned themselves in sort of a, perhaps a squatting or kneeling position, <clears throat> right in the middle, on December the 21st, you would notice that the sun rises right in the entranceway. And also notice a sort of a notch that is sort of centered in the uh, doorway of this chamber. And uh, I have witnessed this, and the whole uh, chamber floods with light. And there's only a very few days in which one would be able to to see this event. And that is one very specific example where we know of a chamber that is oriented for the winter solstice sunrise. Um, we can't say it was built that way on purpose, but we can say this one does exist. Uh, work done by Sal Tranto uh, indicates that uh, it might be, uh, one might be able to statistically prove that many of these chambers were indeed built with uh, such an orientation as to uh, perhaps uh, be able to witness the winter solstice or equinox sunrise. Uh, I understand out of about 50 of them that he uh, has studied, uh, somewhere near 80% of them were oriented to, to, to this fashion. At the center of much of the controversy are these massive stone chambers. Warren Cook. Here in Vermont, and in other states to the south and east of us are many, many, now in the hundreds, great slab roof structures in which the common denominator is a roof made out of giant stones that weigh two and three tons apiece. Now the controversy hinges upon whether these are colonial root cellars or are indeed of greater antiquity. On the basis of our very uh, intensive data on 38 of the chambers and uh, archival literature research, uh, we have established the possibility that they were built by colonial farmers, that some were built as root cellars, and others were built for other purposes. The latest phase of our research in Vermont is that we've been finding associations between these sl great slab roof structures and copper mining. One of the great thrills of my, uh, the last two years of investigation was to feel the blast of cold air 
coming out from under that stone. Because as we looked under it, we were not only looking through this 26 foot chamber, but straight into a copper mine. And uh, well, this tends to bolster our tentative hypothesis that these stone structures in Vermont were built by miners concerned with finding copper. Now, since the inscriptions on a number of the chambers are uh, shown by Barry Fell to have affinities with Celtiberian, why uh, it is a very reasonable hypothesis that these miners were Celtiberian, that is, Basque, Spanish, Portuguese miners with expertise in copper mining brought here by some nation with the seafaring ability. Uh, at that time, of course, the Phoenicians were in dominance over Iberia, so that uh, at the time of the, ins the inscriptions seemed to point to, so that uh, that is the drift of our thinking right now, but it is not yet uh, totally established, uh, but it, it's a very strong possibility. Now, what you have here is in the exact architectural tradition of these 50 plus other structures here in Vermont. And if you take into account Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York State, and Pennsylvania, why the number is approaching two or 300 now. Inscriptions and carvings in solid rock. Impressively accurate astronomical alignments and structures made of enormous stones also astronomically aligned. This evidence suggests to a number of scholars that heretofore unknown cultures once inhabited New England, cultures which may well have been colonies of European megalithic peoples. To others, also experts, the evidence is far from conclusive uh, I think they firmly believe what they have. But I am incensed, I am amazed that individuals who find marked stones make no attempt to talk to geologists, make no attempt to eliminate alternative explanations before jumping to the conclusion these are marked stones. State geologist Charles Raté. About a year, year and a half ago, I, at the request of Giovanna Neudorfer, our state archaeologist, uh, attended a, a get-together with Warren Cook and some of his colleagues. Uh, we met at Salisbury, Vermont, where he had recognized some what he thought to be uh, Ogam inscriptions on some rock uh, in that town. He was looking at some of the rocks in a stone wall and in a drywall foundation. And I guess there was a third site we looked at that was a, uh, a foundation for a church, a, a regular concreted foundation with the main blocks being the natural stone. Now what I saw was a dola stone, limestone kind of rock with very fine hairline fractures in the rock these fractures were at right angles to one another. And in a rock of this nature, which is made of mostly calcium carbonate, it's very highly soluble in just ordinary rainwater. So every time it rains, the rain concentrates along these little breaks in the rock and weather the rock a little more rapidly along the fracture than it does along the open face of the rock so that you had these little indentations along the fracture system. Now, as I mentioned, the fracture system was very closely uh, at right angles, so that you would get uh, indentations that looked like L's and T's and, and these kinds of letterings. This particular phenomenon right here and right here is solution along an old bedding plane. Uh, that is quite common in the uh, in that particular rock formation. These are the kinds of things that are, are, are uh, 
not uncommon as fractures in the limestone which have uh, dissolved, again the differential weathering, more readily than the surrounding rock. All I'm saying is that we have evidence in Vermont that what some people are saying to be algum is not. And I think that we have to reevaluate our assessment of any particular individual who on one hand says one thing and yet we can disprove him on some things. Even the solar alignments, so carefully plotted by Dix, may have a strikingly modern origin. Also, I think it would pay somebody to go back into the records of Norwich University quite extensively because when they, they were over in Norwich and not in Northfield, the guy who started the, the Norwich University, Alden Partridge, took his troops out on, a, on long hikes. They sometimes spent weeks hiking up and down the Connecticut River and they built sun az azimuth types of s rock circles to, to judge latitude and longitude. It was part of their engineering course that he was teaching them. And I think some of those things that Mr. Dix has run across could very well be relics of that or something like it rather than anything more more exciting than, than, than Phoenicians or Minoans. What is happening in this controversy is far from unusual. Whenever the claim of a new discovery is made, almost inevitably conflict results. We've seen a, so far as I can gather, around 1870 or 1880, some very forceful leading American archaeologists of that time, for reasons best known to themselves, concluded that Columbus was the first visitor to North America from the West. Their readings were not so extensive as to include Viking sagas, so they didn't uh, consider them. If they had known about them, I think they would have accepted the Viking sagas, but they didn't apparently know about them. Frederick Pohl translated many of these sagas, and they led him to the now accepted discovery of Leif Erikson's home on Cape Cod. But eventually, at the end of 30 years of research, I have 89 geographical identifications of uh, points mentioned or implied in the sagas, in the uh, stories of the Viking voyages to Vinland. Now, these were the stories of Leif Erikson and his brothers and his half-sister Freydis and where they went and his cousin Karsefni. And in general, it was this. Leif Erikson landed on Cape Cod and saw only about 30 miles of coastline. Paul sees the Vermont discoveries as similar to his own. My impression is that whenever anything new is presented in any field, geology, any field, the uh, academicians the conservative-minded scholars are very slow to accept. And uh, they're cautious, and that's good human nature. And uh, many of them will die before they will change their minds. So you have to wait until they've passed away and young people come forward who are open-minded. And uh, this is the way truth seeps into the human race, gets accepted. So October 1492 became the official date of entry of uh, Westerners into North America by their uh, belief and uh, what their reasoning was, I don't know. I do know that they then had to explain away some awkward facts. The occurrence of ancient Roman coins in Indian burial mounds, for example, this they explained by a method which, to me, as a former zoologist, is ludicrous. They said that they were carried into the mounds by pack rats, which found them coins that had been lost by modern American collectors since uh, 1492, had been found by pack rats and carried down into the mounds and neatly deposited beside the bones within. Since pack rats are uh, prairie animals and we have no information that the climate of the east 
was ever such as to promote prairies in this uh, part of North America within the last 10 million years. This is a very ludicrous explanation, but it's one that they found satisfactory. Uh, when America BC was published, the uh, response was extraordinarily mixed. The first reviews were so astonishingly hostile, one would scarcely know that what the book was about. For example, a professor in England called Glenn Daniels wrote a review in the New York Times which didn't once mention that the book dealt with inscriptions. He led it to be understood that it was a stupid book by an amateur on archaeology, and his opening sentences were, this is a rubbish book. One of the classic means of resisting recognition of new finds in history and archaeology is to reject them by ignoring them, by finding better things to do than study the new found evidence. There have been certain individuals, however, who have felt it uh, a self-appointed task to attack the credibility and the uh, wisdom of the people that are doing this research. And uh, one can't help but uh, regard such attitudes as an obstacle to pushing back the frontiers of knowledge. Uh, with the discovery of some stone huts and some other uh, artifacts, a group of individuals, not as a group, but generally as individuals, occasionally acting in groups, uh, put forward the hypothesis of Celtic settlement. In, uh, in strictly logical terms, they're the old people. And they were enjoined in a debate, uh, largely when the group looking at these went to established scholars and other established institutions, uh, such as the Vermont Council for Historic Preservation, the Vermont Historical Society, scholars at the University of Vermont and uh, at the various Vermont State Colleges, and ask their opinion. And when they began to get that opinion, it didn't always agree with the hypothesis or the claim being put forward. And it's interesting that those putting forward the hypothesis of Celtic occupation have essentially put the burden of proof, if you will, uh, on a variety of agencies that in, ma in many ways were not really involved and have used them to some extent as a straw man or a stalking horse against which they profound their theories. But what we're, I think, severely questioning is the rigor of uh, the approach that they've used in exhibiting evidence, so-called. Now, I don't know the dictionary definition of the word evidence. Uh, if, if evidence is anything that demonstrates something, then I guess what they have shown, excuse me, is evidence. Um, if what they think they are showing is data or scientific proof, uh, they're absolutely wrong. Well, I think it's fair to say that the, that the humanities and the social sciences, like the physical sciences, uh, probably finally never prove a particular hypothesis or theory true. Uh, they dismiss a great many of them, they show them to be false, and the ones that stand the test of the long period of inquiry by a community of scholars in that area are likely to come to be taken to be the truth, and for, some, uh, I think, good and sufficient reason in most instances. And the historian really is looking always for probable truths, uh, whether or not they cast it in those terms, I think. And the archaeologist does the same thing. The archaeologist is really presented with a, with a great deal of evidence uh, and must, from that evidence, attempt to decipher what likely happened uh, to produce it. It is not merely the conclusion, but the process through which it was derived which must stand scrutiny. So it, it follows that one only, uh, one tends to find what he expects to find because that's what he's been conditioned to find. This cuts, this sword cuts every way. It applies to Giovanna as well as to myself. No. I'm not qualified to judge his qualifications. I'm qualified to judge the methodology these people have used and fellows used. Science, you have to verify things. You can't have one person say something and everyone else believe it. You have to have many people doing the same experiment and getting the same conclusions and then you have a fact or a hypothesis that stands. Um, therefore, 
I'm not saying that he is an error. I'm saying that uh, I cannot believe, as a scientist, something that just one person tells me. While books and journals are most frequently the vehicles of academic controversy, at conferences, adversaries may confront each other directly. This one was held at Castleton State College. A very rich many people who came across both the and campus, bearing boatloads of ideas, bringing great quantities of cultural material, and that is ultimately the explanation of the origins of the American Indian civilizations. Now that's going to be extremely difficult for the American archaeologists to adjust to, but that is the model of what you're going to see developed. Well, I think the ancient Vermont conference was a concept that originally started in Dr. Cook's mind and he happened to drop by one afternoon, I think it was during the summer, to talk about the possibility of bringing not only national but international experts together to consider some of the evidence evidences that had been witnessed in Vermont relating to uh, past history and he wondered if the institution would be interested in hosting such a conference fully realizing the controversial nature of that conference and uh, asked me if I would be interested in the institution doing that. I think as we discussed it and as he gave me further information about the project I think the reaction my reaction was that yes the institution would be interested in doing that because I think the institution has an obligation not only to its students and its faculty but to the uh, area that we're in to the state and to the public at large to bring controversial issues to their attention. Um, a huge amount of the material that you present is supposedly well known as crackpot science. Every word that is deciphered is cited by page and uh, every single detail is given. What else can you possibly want? You don't know what you're talking about. We felt that there must be a search for truth, and I think certainly the conference was that type of thing. It was a search for truth. I think it, it addressed very definitely the questions of what, how, and why, and I think those are questions that are in all of our minds as an institution. We must be looking for them. Like most highly specialized matters, academic issues are interpreted to the public by the media. Much of the ancient Vermont controversy was covered by the Rutland Herald. A professor from Castleton State College Thursday made public an important new find of ancient sites in southeastern Vermont. And Barry Fell, a retired Harvard professor who two years ago advanced the theory of Celtic settlements in Vermont over 2,000 years ago, ran into devastating criticism here Friday night. Face it, there are no Agam inscriptions in the hills of to Vermont. To hold any other belief, to retain any shred of the theories that have been advanced over the past few years as to arrivals of Europeans in batches large enough for settled communities, is to fly in the face of all the means by which historical facts there tested. were no Celts in pre-Columbian Vermont. We covered what everybody said, and then we, then I just drew some judgments based upon what people said, and that was that seemed to have aroused more, more f feedback than the actual coverage. Quite often the case. Yeah, I was thinking, do you usually find and then everybody media? damns the media for for not being not being accurate when actually what they're talking about is that they disagree with the editorials as if it were not somebody's prerogative to express an opinion. I think the media has to express an opinion. Where there is as yet no, no consensus amongst the scholars in the field that the best approach might well be to present the most cogent arguments on either side and not make the elitist presupposition that the viewing public would be incapable of deciding insofar as it's a decidable question, uh, which seemed the most plausible. Uh, I do believe that there's one area where Vermont is blameworthy. You have a very bad press. Uh, I have never encountered a paper in any other city that handles things as badly as yours does. It's had a very deleterious effect on the advance of our knowledge by causing a great many people to be misled and thinking that what we're doing is stupid. So what, what do you think well, I think he's quite mistaken. I think he's very sincere, but he certainly, I, I feel he's mistaken. 
and uh, that's just that certainly is my opinion. I would, I wouldn't be, wouldn't be. Uh, uh, I would be very surprised if I were turned out to be mistaken, but instead of instead of him. But I think that he just has a theory that he is that he finds facts to apply to, and instead of the other way around. One of the obstacles in uh, in uh, securing adequate media coverage of these things is that most reporters <clears throat> don't have sufficient anthropological background to understand what they're describing. And uh, inevitably, the different stories that have appeared over the past two years have each been written by a person without any background that started essentially from ground zero. And so a great many of inaccuracies have crept into every single newspaper or magazine account and uh, making the people to whom these statements are credited look like fools. It's like any other judgment call in a, in a sport. A referee calls a, a foul and it may, he may be right and he may not be right. Uh, if you want to know my personal reason for drawing a judgment is that there, there was very little academic backing for some of the statements that were made. The media has an obligation, along with educational institutions, to expand the general awareness of the public and to appraise them or apprise them of what's going on without arriving at conclusions, in many cases, on the basis of very scanty evidence. Uh, and that's the thing that I think where the difficulty in this situation arose. I wouldn't say the Rutland Herald was out to get us. I think the Rutland Herald, unfortunately, uh, failed to realize the central purpose of this. The issue of whether the question of pre-Columbian settlement in the Green Mountains uh, is not one that's ultimately going to be decided correctly uh, through the media. They might influence through uh, popular pressure uh, the kinds of funding. Funding is crucial for graduate study, archaeological digs, and historical inquiry. Is the source of funding also the source of truth? Well, research in the social sciences in particular is funded largely by federal and corporate funds. Uh, universities receive as much as 68 to 72 percent of each grant as a fee for administering it. So if I apply for a $100,000 grant, the university will receive $300,000, of which my 100000 will be dispersed by them. That has the effect of making universities very much concerned to find the greatest grant getters that they can. And the sources of the grants from, from corporations, from the military industrial complex, often have a rather narrow focus and a certain set of otherwise rather dubious presuppositions. But researchers tend to be drawn into uh, applying for grants where the money is and allowing the terms sent by the granting agencies to determine the kind of research they do. Universities tend to seek out people who are adept at that enterprise. They're called grants people. Um, so that there's a tendency for the final source of funding, the corporations or the government often acting instead of the corporations, uh, to, con to shape the whole structure, not only of what kind of inquiry goes on, but ultimately who does the inquiry. I think our system of funding has become largely responsible for this disaster. Uh, graduate students in the American system are supported largely by monies obtained by the professors that they would like to work with. And the professors obtain the monies uh, from national organizations generally, supported out of tax funds, and their applications are vetted by other colleagues who either write that they're good or bad archaeologists. Naturally, nobody wants to irritate anybody else so that you can have a a total closed circle of everybody recommending everybody inside that circle. Money is the traditional method of attributing social value to an activity. If we are to fund research in the humanities and social sciences, why? If the Vermont phenomena are ruins of a pre-Columbian European civilization, or not, what of it? I'm not clear that it would have any specific effect on the amount of money that you took home uh, at the end of the week or the day or the month, or that it would help us solve the energy problem. 
but I do think uh, it might, at least in the scholarly world, uh, be useful in the sense that it might prick a little bubble in, in some intellectual arrogance. And if we stand some hope of being able to have a, a fulcrum from which to bring about constructive and humane social change in the immediate future, it's surely going to depend on a sound historical understanding of how we got where we are and the extent to which our present problems come from a diminished sense of history, a sense that all values are, are instantaneous and in the immediate creation of modern society uh, is surely uh, one of the difficulties we need to overcome. The humanities, uh, what are they? I, you know, there are a lot of different uh, definitions here, but I think the humanities have to do with thinking and creative man. Um, thinking and creative man. People at the optimum of their power. Uh, the reason I think they're worth investigating is, first of all, they're there and they beg understanding. And whether they turn out to be uh, 19th century or late 18th century, or Indian, or indeed ancient, uh, they're there, and, and uh, I feel a compulsion to understand their significance. And, and I think that's the real issue. If we don't understand ourselves, the world we live in, and the major issues, there is no chance that this world that we live in will become better. Around 1870 or 1880, some very forceful leading American archaeologists of that time concluded that Columbus was the first visitor to North America from the West. I have witnessed this, and the whole chamber floods with light. There have been certain individuals, however, who have felt it uh, a self-appointed task to attack the credibility and the uh, wisdom of the people that are doing this research. I do believe that there's one area where Vermont is blameworthy, you have a very bad press. It's like any other judgment call in a, in a sport. I don't think that's a bad lesson to understand that there were things and people and civilizations and settlement that somehow uh, were before us. Thinking and creative man. Um, thinking and creative man. People at the optimum of their power. And uh, many of them will die before they will change their minds. So you have to wait until they passed away and young people come forward who are open-minded and this is the way truth seeps into the human race, gets accepted.